Would you please call the roll? All right, Commissioner Arnrich. Present. Commissioner Butt. Here. Commissioner Glover is absent. Commissioner Haskew. Here. Commissioner Hudson. He's absent. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Commissioner Mitchoff. Here. Commissioner Romick. Here. Commissioner Taylor. Here. Vice Chair Geringer. Here. Chair Pierce. Here. Representative Allen. She's here. I see Representative Allen. I'm here. Present. She's here. <laughs> Representative Worth. Here. And Representative Wilson is absent. Okay, we'll keep an eye out for when Dave and Federal get here. So it's Dave's birthday, so I'm not sure he'll be here. What kind of an excuse is that? What oh, I use it all the time. <laughs> he, had a, he had a council meeting, but was going to try to be here. <laughs> all right. Well, I got some stuff I got to read here, folks. So due to the shelter in place and COVID-19, the authority has chosen Zoom as its meeting platform. And during the meeting, please mute your mic. Um, if you haven't already done so, mute your mic now. Um, I will request any committee questions and comments on an agenda item. If you'd like to speak, please physically raise your hand. That means like this, so we can see you. As a co-host, you do not have the ability to raise your hand via, oh, is that for me or somebody else for uh, via the Zoom meeting platform? Uh, Terry Ann and I will keep an eye on all of you to see who wants to speak. And to speak, please unmute your mic. After you speak, remute it. Paper shuffling, etc., makes noise. I will request a public comment. And if any of the public, do we have public attending yet, Terry Ann? I haven't looked. Doesn't look like it. We have uh, some individuals on the line. I'm not sure if it's consultants or the public. Yeah, okay. I don't see anybody but participants. I don't see any attendees. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm making everyone a co-host right now. Okay, all right. Um, so if you um, are on the phone and want to raise your hand, press star nine. Terry Ann or I will call on you. Um, and then you'll have to remute your mic. You will have three minutes to speak. After three minutes, your mic will be automatically muted and your hand will be lowered. If an action item is required uh, on an agenda item, I will call for the vote. The clerk will call a roll call vote. And when she calls on you, please unmute your mic, vote, and then mute your mic. And everybody knows you can hit the space bar on your computer or your iPad to speak, correct? Roll calls, call, yes. call the cities, and try and see where they are on their individual, individual projects that they're working on so that we can see where we can save some money. Um, so thank you very much to my coworkers here at CCTA. Um, I truly appreciate everything that you have done. Um, so capital projects and financial, financial commitments to the individual cities and agencies, as I discussed, were reviewed. So we were able to cut about $11.8 million. Um, a big item in there is we've been carrying year to year in the capital, capital budget, a $5 million earmark payment to to Caltrans for some work, some oversight or, or some overruns and some other items that are not part of the co-op that we have. So we're in negotiations with them. Um, Tim is working on that. In addition, Tim tonight has put together a staff report where he has been working with his staff and consultants and discussing some additional actions that we can take. So. We're not gonna stop projects that have federal funding. We're not gonna stop other projects that have current funding commitments and enough resources. But what we wanna do is we wanna hit pause. We wanna take a moment to see 
what's essential as far as our projects are going and make sure that we continue and don't overcommit should this continue for another six months, one year, two years, or three years. So as I brought to you in May, you know, the biggest item is sales tax because sales tax trickles down in our 29 different programs that we have is all based off of the sales tax numbers that we have. But just to recap, um, we were looking at about $94 million that was going to happen in this fiscal year. But then in March, um, the COVID-19 happened. So then we brought our budget down to 80.5 million. So that's a $13.5 million reduction for just the months of March through June. So our sales tax projected for 2021 and working with HDL and looking at some of the numbers, it's gonna be down, we're, we're taking it down another 5% to 76.5 million. So as, as you look at this total combined um, decrease, it's about 17.5% from the strategic plan. And when we put the strategic plan in front of you in 2019, we knew there was gonna be a slight decrease decrease in sales tax because you all there's always dips along the road and we were looking for possibly 2021 um, so we had a little bit of a reduction planned for this year but we had no idea it was going to be this big so our total projected sales tax loss over the two years is 29.7 million dollars so staff will continue to monitor and we'll bring you quarterly updates i'll again as we get to the next slide I'll show you some of the updates I got from HDL today. They're very positive, but then again, we don't know what's gonna happen and how bad it was in April and May and how things are gonna move forward. So when I presented in, in earlier this month, I said I'd work, get back, you know, the, the information is starting to come through. So we won't have our final data until probably next week, but I was able to get some preliminary reports and so as we were looking at the January through March of 2020, we were missing payments for CCTA. We were missing about $3.3 million. Statewide, I think it was about $200 million on the re report that I saw earlier today. Um, and some of these payments may fall under the payment deferral program that the governor put in. Some of these may be the result of closing businesses or late filing. So we don't know when this money's gonna come in, but right now the estimated amount is about $3.3 million. So HDL is working with the state to figure out who has applied for the deferral program. We'll continue to look at who has the late payments. Um, but on the positive side, Amazon remained very strong. Um, the big box stores that remained open had some really good reportings for the end of March. Um, we don't know what that's gonna be for April, May, and June. Um, we won't get the numbers for the end of June until August. Uh, we really won't know all the details until September, but for our financials for the end of the year, we're going to get that information in our August payment. It's usually about the third week in August. So our position on the sales tax budget, based on the information that we have today, let's, we're still going to go with the $76.5 million. Um, again, this all depends on how the reopening happens, how much pent-up demand is for some things. Um, we'll have to see how this rolls out. So with that, I'll get to the regular budget presentation. Um, the sales tax we discussed, um, federal, state, and local revenues is up. We have a lot of projects and programs that have federal, state, and local funding that's earmarked. Um, obviously the 684 project, the I-680 project is getting a lot of that funding. We also have investment in other income. The investment earnings is going down and interest rates are going down, but the current holdings that we have right now are still earning higher interest rates than what's available right now. We'll hold on to those till maturity, um, but we will most likely, depending on how the sales tax pans out for the next six months, we may have to draw down on our investments to stay current with all our payments. Um, one of the items that came up at the APC meeting is how we make our payments. So we pay our consultants when we get the invoices. We have to therefore turn around and do some reimbursements. Um, we've sped up that process instead of doing them quarterly on some of the bigger projects. We've been working with some of the local agencies to do them monthly so that we can speed up our cash flow. So we don't have to dip into our investments to make our payments. Uh, but we're prepared to make those 
make those decisions and go down that path if needed. So here we are, the other sources is $48 million. So since the beginning of Measure J and Measure C, we've accumulated funds in each year and we earmark money for the projects and programs. And if we don't spend the money in those years, it builds up over years. And at the end in 2034, we're supposed to be paying out all of our funds, all our capital construction. So currently right now we have a, we have a healthy reserve. So the project section is all a timing of the capital projects. You can see a decrease of $15 million. Again, this relates to the capital projects. Uh, the 684 project had much more expenditures and construction expenditures in 1920. When we look at 2021, hopefully that project will be done. We'll be further along on the 680 project and some other capital projects that we have going on. Again, those projects are still moving forward. We're not working on reducing any of those contracts. Um, we have sufficient funding. The program section, that's all based off of sales tax allocation. So what we do is we go through there and we look at some funding. Um, an example in there is we have some funds set aside for the ferry, the ferry program. The ferry program may or may not run at full speed like it was prior to the COVID-19. So there might be some savings in there as well. The planning section, we have an increase of about 353,000. It typically runs about $3.2, $3.5 million on a year-to-year -year basis. The increase there, we have PPM funding, which is state and local funding that we get through the gas tax that's passed along to the authority to implement the program for the planning and CMA functions. Um, so there's an allocation of staff members that gets moved over. The administration section, we have a decrease of $2.7 million. As you know, we had the sales tax measure last fiscal year. Um, and that ended up being about $2.7 million for the county to put it on the ballot. Um, so therefore, we don't have it in this year's budget, so that's the decrease. Debt service, debt service, we typically usually have about a level, level debt service. We're going to see a little bit of increase in the next few years, but it's going to stay right around $43, $44 million as we go through 2034. So here shows the sales tax projections. We've talked about this in length, but I'll just go over it quickly. You can see we had that huge 2019 at 96.6 million, and we're looking at in fiscal year 21, 76 million. So that's a drastic hit related to COVID-19. Here's our capital projects. Our capital projects is getting the, a large source of local, federal, and state funding. As you can see, there's about $74.4 million in there. In here, we have RM2, RM3. Also at the APC meeting, there was a question about RM3. There could be a delay in getting the RM3. So we've earmarked that and we've kept it in the budget as a placeholder. Um, Tim is working with ECRFA. Um, potentially there can be a loan from ECRFA to continue this project. We, we will not move forward with this project unless we have a guaranteed funding source. Um, again, all of these funding sources are allocated to the individual projects, and I'll show you that on another slide. Um, the planning, CMA, and PDA function of the authority, we're also getting federal surface transportation of 1.2 million, that's for the CMA function. We also have a contribution from MTC for the SR4 express lane study. So planning goes out and does a lot of studies, we get commitments, um, I believe it's $150,000 from MTC, $150,000 from CCTA. Um, when we apply all of the federal funding and contributions for some regional projects, the CMA agencies potentially based on the budget could contribute up to $150,000 for next year's work. Um, the motor, motor vehicle surcharge, we always get about $1.7 million. That's what our budget is um, given to us by TFCA for next year. We also have a contribution from GoMenum. GoMenum gives us a contribution to pay for staff salaries for the allocation of time put on the GoMenum project. We also have um, a contribution from the city of San Ramon, earmarked for $1.7 million for the Iron Horse Trail overcrossing. Ivan is working on that project. We will be administering those contracts on behalf of San Ramon. So therefore there'll be a contribution from San Ramon to offset those funds. So as we looked at the uh, capital projects in Measure J, 
Um, we have in the bottom left, it shows about $90 million in proposed budget expenditures. And then once we layer in the $72.6 million of expenditures, you can see how each project is affected. So there's about 2.7 of RM3 funds that we, that we had just mentioned. Those are earmarked for the McCollumy Bridge um, overcrossing project. You can see RM2 funds on the I-680 corridor, but you see the bulk of the projects on the I-680 project is 14.6 million. And then you see up two rows and over a little bit, the I-684 interchange, we see state funding of $32.6 million. So at the end of the day, at the end of next year, if all of our budgets come to fruition and we pay all of the proposed budgets and receive all the revenues as expected, it will be about a $17.2 million that of earmarked funds from Measure J that's been collected in prior years. So the, the capital projects, as we look at them from year to year, um, capital projects are just like your cities. Um, the capital projects, we'll, we'll throw a budget out there, we'll, we'll based on what our projected growth and, and expenditures are gonna be for that year, but it's something could happen, something could get delayed. And so that budget shows up the next year. So when you look at the, the left-hand column for mid-year, 110 million, and then you throw in the proposed budget of 100 million, that's not $210 million of commitments. Those are still commitments that we've brought to the board to get approval, but it's just the timing and expect, expectations of when we're gonna realize these expenditures. So our salaries and benefits for the authority is about $5.2 million. It's down $172,000 from the mid-year budget that we presented earlier this year. Um, in our authorized positions, we have 20. The current staffing at, at CCTA is 18 employees, and we're currently filling the associate transportation planner that had a vacancy with the departure of James Hemcap. Um, I believe Terry Ann and Randy have put together an offer for an individual that may start in July. So I've added that individual into the budget for next year. So in our fiscal year 2020 21 budget and employees, we have 19, and it includes a 2.5% CPI. Um, the director of projects position has been vacant since December 2019. And that position is currently being filled by the senior engineer as the acting director of projects. With the vacancy in, in projects, it's planned to continue to be vacant through 2020, 2021. And the estimate savings from that position is about $335,000 for salaries and benefits. Um, our annual PERS rates for our employees, the employer pays is going from 9.68% to 10.4. That's a very low number. Um, based on the contributions of the lump sum payments we've made over the last few several years um, and our annual contribution to OPEB, which is the retirement um, health care, is fully funded and we contribute about 9.9% on that. So it is administration. It's uh, $2.3 million and I mentioned the $2.7 million decrease from the year before based off of the March ballot. Um, salaries and benefits are going to be about $779,000, and this represents 1.02% of the 1% limitation by Measure J. So when we look at this strategic plan, we, there's 29 different categories, and 1% of the revenue that re, we receive over the life of the measure is supposed to go to administration. We always run about 80 to 85%, but since we have the decrease in sales tax, we might be we might get really close to the 1%, um, but there are reserves from prior years that can be used if needed. I'm gonna do my best to ensure that they stay low, um, and I'll be giving you an update at the mid-year mid -year budget. Um, increased property lease goes up about 10,000. There's a small inflation factor in there for our lease. Um, the increase of $20,000 for software license and maintenance agreements. And then there's a decrease of $25,000 for attorney fees since mid-year. And that was based off of the rise in attorney fees as we were working on the TEP. Programs is going down $6.1 million based on the percentages of the allocations. Um, it's gonna be about 54.6 million. Um, local street maintenance is gonna be about 15.4 million. Again, 
0.09% of our sales tax is allocated back to the cities for pavement management. Several program budgets were revised to reflect current commitments. The TFC program, we received $1.7 million, and we also pay out about $1.7 million. The GoMentum program is about $450,000. So as the planning section, as we talked about, the planning expenditures increase to reflect con contracted services. There's always growth management program. There also help with other studies that we do. So those monies fluctuate up and down year to year. But the big change this year was the allocation of staff salaries to utilize the PPM funding of $355,000. Debt service is 41.9 million. That's an increase of 1.4 million over the prior year. This is when we go to the market, when we sell the bonds, we try to do a level debt service based off of our sales tax in that particular year. And when we sell the bonds, we sell them on maturities and coupons. And some years is a higher demand. And so they kind of increase as, as, as we get out to 2034. So our Debt service will increase slightly over the next couple of years, but not a lot, but we try and keep level debt service. So the principal amount due is 21.1 million. Interest due is $20.8 million. Um, when we remarketed the 2018 bonds, as you recall, we took out the 200, the $200 million floating rate uh, bonds and we took 100 million off off that and converted it to a fixed rate, but we have to go out and remarket it within three years. So that would have to be done by August, 2021. So I'm currently working, I had meetings with a bank last week, I have another meeting with another bank next week and they're giving us proposals. And so what I'll be doing is coming to the board in September or October with just an overview of where we are and what actions we need to take and some of the most advantageous um, avenues that the, the authority can take. Um, and also at the June APC meeting we had a few weeks ago, it was one of the questions was, is there any risk in the current, current bond structures? There's no risk in there. So it, prior to 2018, we went out and we secured a direct purchase with State Street Bank. And then there were some changes in income taxes and so what that did is that created the authority to have to pay more in interest taxes but now we're tied to the LIBOR rate so there's no risk in that because we're in the public market right now so that's a fix based off of LIBOR. LIBOR is functioning really well right now but LIBOR will end at the end of 2021 but again we have to remarket our bonds by 20 by August of 2021 so we'll be in front of you with an alternate package, depending on what market conditions are as we move forward and be ready to jump on anything that's gonna be favorable to the authority. So with that, staff seeks approval of resolution 2017A, which will adopt the fiscal year 2020-21 budget of $205.2 million. So with that, I'm, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, before we open the public hearing, uh, are there any questions from any of my commissioners? And Brian, if you wouldn't mind taking that down for a minute so I can see them. That's helpful. Newell. Great, Brian. Thank you. Um, it was a great um, sort of deep dive that we got into uh, APC. Um, one of the questions I don't think we really talked about, it's on debt service. Um, can you just review what the... Um, what the reasoning is for the $1.359 million increase this year on debt service? Well, when we issue the bonds, they, they, sometimes they have a sliding scale on interest percentages. Some of them start out at 3% in the early years and go up to 5%. Um, and so some of the increase would be due to when principal is payments as we defer principal to the to the end of 2034 you pay higher interest up front um, until we make those larger payments um, so there there's no there's no changes related to the swap there's no there's no increase related to the floating rate notes it's more of a when the bonds are sold, the lower interest rate in the early years, and then it starts to accumulate up to about 
roughly, I'm going to use a rough estimate of about 5% on most of our, most of our bond issuances. So those were all by contract? Yes. Those aren't elected. Those were based on original purchase contracts? Correct. Okay, great. Um, and then the, uh, I mean, it, it's interesting, just the way you presented, it only shows a $4 million drop on um, sales tax, but it's more like, it's a 17 and a half percent drop. It's, it's you, you're coming off the 80 million you expect for the end of this fiscal year when we were expecting over 90 million. So it doesn't look as, as bad, um, but it is. Um, I, I would just note, and, and I know this is a subject we all have different opinions on and each city is different. I, I just wanna share with you, our city, um, we've asked all of our employees, there would be no raises, and what we call a raise is a cost of living. There is no cola. There's nothing. And we have 10, uh, nine and a half full-time positions that we're having. We haven't done anything like that in more than 25 years. Um, it's an extraordinary time. And it's, in our case, it's not property taxes. It's our sales tax that's dropping. And we're not as big as other cities. And I just say that because, um, you know, we, we all need to be in this together, um, you know, those of us that own companies, we're laying off employees. Um, those of us that um, know other companies, we know everybody in our communities. Um, so I have a little concern of, you know, we're, we're doing something, we're not, we're making cuts, but we're not making cuts to ourselves, or at least we're adding to that. And, and I just, I, I, I say a comment, we're a very unique, small, 19 member organization um, that does a tremendous amount of work um, for such a small staff. Um, I, I appreciate everything it's done. Um, we look forward to next year when we can start to clean up what little um, of our swap bonds and see what it looks like. Um, but otherwise, I think the budget is, is really well done. And Brian, you have had to revise this nearly three times since this started uh, uh, when you originally had the budget done. So um, thank you for that, and I support the budget. Okay, any other questions from my colleagues before we go to public comment? Note for the record that Federal Glover has arrived. He is sitting here in his 49er shirt. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions from uh, or comments from my colleagues, so we will go to public comments, the public hearing is now open. For anyone from the public waiting to make a comment, please raise your hand or press star nine if you're on the phone. And either staff or I will unmute you. I don't see any raised hands at this point. I'm scrolling through our whole group. No raised hands. I don't see any. Do you, Terri Ann? No, I do not. Okay. Um, so with that, I will close the public hearing and ask my colleagues if there are any further comments or a uh, motion. This is Romick, move approval. Second. I have a motion by Romick and a Chris second Kelly by has a question, a comment. Yeah, just yeah. on the budget, on, on the Mudger J funded projects, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, the, the amounts that are gonna be allocated to that we're going to be allocated to all of the, the local agencies totaling over $40 million. You know, that's a lot of money. And I guess those are suspended. Is that right? And then the amounts allocated to the, um, to the authority projects are about 20 million. So I'm just kind of curious as to, you know, what the thinking process was behind all of that. Because the, the local agencies are taking a really big hit here. Can somebody from staff answer that question? Brian, do you have that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give my uh, best effort on that one. So the programs are, the, the projects division is made up and the, and the funding that we receive from, from the sales tax is 42.5% of our sales tax. And the rest of it all go to uh, the programs division. Um, as I mentioned, 20% of it goes to local, local streets that's returned to the cities. Um, and, and that's part of that local contribution of programs. Um, so did that answer your question? So let me answer a different way. Thank you, Brian. So Commissioner Kelly, you're gonna get 
your 18% in West County, you'll get 20% of the yearly allocation. It comes every two years and you go through that growth management checklist. So that money is coming your way to do your paving projects. The 20 million that's in the capital program, Tim's going to talk about that and how we're, we're planning to allocate or hoping for approval on the principles of how we allocate future dollars on major construction projects. So Tim will answer your second part of your question. Your first part of your question, you're getting your 20% of the yearly take over the next two years if that's the cycle. And I think that's the cycle this year and next year. And then you'll, you'll, get, you'll get a tip for that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so most of us have whatever's in the bank to do this year's work, but the next round, it may take a bit of a hit and we may have to do a little less in the next cycle. Um, any other comments by commissioners before we vote? Loella, I like okay. Queen's wave. Yes, yes, well, I, I needed to get attention. Um, the, the good news is Walnut Creek is going to institute um, charging for parking at full rates on the streets as of July. Um, the economy has picked up enough that people are fighting over parking spaces. We've had to open the garages and one of the restaurants has reported, we've had a few open with patios and things like that. And they reported that last Friday's um, income was 85% of normal um, for what it was before COVID. So I'm only telling you this, it is so microscopic in terms of being a good statistic, but it is a piece of hope. And hopefully that's ongoing, not pent up demand. Yes. Okay, any other comments? Dave, you were waving your arms around. Happy birthday. <laughs> okay, that wasn't a request to speak. I don't have birthdays anymore. Yeah, well, we'll say happy year then, okay? Okay, I don't see anyone else raising their hand to speak. We do have a motion and a second on the floor. And we have closed the public hearing. So we will now um, have Terry Ann call the roll for a vote. Okay, and I just wanted to apologize to Representative Maureen Powers. Um, she is also present and attending on behalf of Representative Wilson. So I did not acknowledge you. Sorry about that uh, in the roll call vote. All right, Commissioner Arnridge. Yes. Commissioner Butt. Yes. Commissioner Glover. Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Romick? Yes. Commissioner Taylor? Yes. Vice Chair Geringer? Yes. Chair Pierce? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda <laughs> is um, the review of the CMA budget. We just looked at the authority budget. Now we're going to look at the CMA budget, I believe. Is that right? Yes. And Ivan Ramirez, you're, oh no, we're going to the 684 interchange, right? Sometimes in my annotated. That's correct. I get correct. Ivan's going to present. Uh, 684. 684, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Go, Ivan. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. And if I may, happy birthday to Commissioner Hudson. So uh, we have two items today from uh, construction. Uh, uh, by the way, my name is Ivan Ramirez and I'm the construction manager for the authority. And uh, the first item is gonna be an information item only where I'm gonna provide an update to uh, the board on the status of the I-680 State Route 4 Interchange Improvements Project Phase 3 and subsequent to that uh, item to uh, stop retention for the contractor. Um, so that's gonna be our second item. Uh, before I go on, uh, is, is, can you hear me well? Can you see the screen well? Looks good. All right, thank you. So uh, commissioner, so as you may remember, this project went to construction on November 14th of 2018. Uh, I wanna reject your memory about this project because 
the bids came in higher than was estimated in the engineer's estimate by about five and a half million dollars. So the project already was kind of a little bit in, in the hole as we started the project. Uh, and uh, thankfully, despite numerous um, inconveniences and challenges that we have encountered, the, pro the progress in the field has gone very well. And stage one was completed during the Labor Day, I'm sorry, Memorial Day weekend. During that entire week, there were some traffic switches that occurred. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But uh, I wanna also rejoice your memory on the resolution 1859P, which is what authorized this project to go into construction, which had a total amount of bid items of about $86.3 million. Uh, supplemental funds were about 1.8. Furnished materials about $677,000. There was a contingency provided of about $8.82 million for a total allotment of $97 million and plus dollars. So here's some of the progress that has occurred. This is the interchange on uh, 680 and 4. This is looking in the eastbound direction. And I don't know, it, it might be difficult to see, but what we have done is we moved traffic to the median. Mm -hmm. So we, since the project started, most of the work has occurred along the median, although there's been some work also on either side of the freeway. And uh, the, with the idea of putting traffic in the median, what that work was completed, and then do some work on uh, another portion of the, of the alignment uh, outside of the median. So when we did that, we were able to provide the traffic switch, and uh, this is a picture that displays what we did. This, uh, this project, and especially Grayson Creek, requires two seasons because access to Grayson Creek is restricted between June 15th and October 15th, so no work can occur there. So the contractor was racing against time to make this traffic because if they miss the deadline, then they, they cannot work on, on and that, that will delay the project. And so the contractor has pushed and has achieved this goal and has been uh, very favorable to the schedule of the, of the construction contract. So going along here, you can see that, uh, so this is Bridge to Land Away. Along the median, you can see that there's a lot of uh, concrete trucks lined up and there's a concrete pump and uh, they were building this uh, bridge or at the time we took these videos and these photos and the project is, uh, I'm sorry, the bridge is not complete. Similar to Peralta Road, the bridges are complete, and you can see that, uh, sorry, let me backtrack a little bit, that there's also a lot of work um, after the bridge has been built. There's a lot of paving that has occurred, a lot of paving that's ongoing, and uh, there's still some more work along the median to connect the, the, the bridges where the traffic used to run. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenge that we have encountered. Uh, this is a situation where these uh, circles in orange and the dot in the median, that's where you were gonna have a pile, it's a pile so that the bridge can be supported. As you can see, and, and this is true by the way, along many locations in the project where in this case, it looks like there's an overpour when the bridge was originally constructed. And now it's in the way of uh, the drilling by the contractor and this creates uh, extra work for the contractor. It delays the work because now you're not drilling through dirt. You also have to find a way to get rid of the concrete that's in the way. And so that's uh, uh, one of the problems that we have encountered at numerous locations that has increased the price of the project. This is uh, another situation that uh, has been unfortunate. The detail that is shown there uh, in small where it says void, uh, this barrier rail was supposed to be removed, but there was supposed to be a void right it's, uh, in the middle of it. Well, it turns out, as you can see on the picture on the left, that is solid concrete. So what that does, it increases the amount of work for the contractor, the processing of the concrete, because it has to be separated from the rebar so it can be disposed of properly. And then of course has to be shipped and, and disposed of. So that has increased the cost. We have numerous cases like this too, where there's different site conditions. And in addition to the, that, in this case, on the right picture where you see that green mat, there is a drainage system and it's a, it's a drainage system that is non-standard because it's like a long slot that's catching the water. Well, that was not contemplated in the contract. So when we showed up in construction, we had to deal with this issue and, and we had to remove it. 
in essence. But that was also a different site condition that was not in the contract documents when they went out to bid. This is a, another situation that uh, created a lot of additional costs for the project. Uh, there is a transition, whether it's between a bridge and concrete payment or a bridge and AC payment or AC payment with concrete payment, where there's gotta be a transition for that, for those, whatever type of payment you're connecting. And, and unfortunately, it's not very clearly defined in the contract documents. So a change order had to be issued to address those transitions because it requires additional excavation, additional backfill, and sometimes uh, additional concrete as well. And this, this is true in uh, several transitions along the project. This is another example of what we have to deal with. Uh, this is a, a K-rail that has to be aligned just next to that yellow stripe. And as you can see, we have done that per plan. Unfortunately, where the weeds are growing, that's a construction joint that has to be replaced. And unfortunately, even though we met the requirements of what was stipulated in the contract, the work cannot proceed because the carrier is over the, the joint. So that requires some uh, additional work, which is restriping, removing of the carrier. So that also has contributed to the cost and, and it might, depending on how the, we negotiate with the contractor, some time impacts. This is a, another example of what we have encountered in the field. Um, on the left side the, is the existing condition where we are going to be putting a, a expansion joint, which on the right side is that black, that black stripe that is sitting on its side. So in order to put that joint in, in this proper way, you have to have a smooth surface. So obviously we cannot do that with, on the left side. So we had to actually pay the contractor to mobilize one of their subcontractors and suck a uh, significant lens so that we were able to put the, the expansion joint in its proper way. And that's demonstrated on the, on the right side of the picture. Uh, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of these changes, uh, commissioners, because even though these changes are uh, manifesting themselves in, during construction, the reality is that this, for instance, this, this soccer and this work needs to happen in order to do the project correctly. So while we lost the leverage that we had at bid time where the contractors are trying to get the lowest cost possible, so it would have been very good for us to have the scope there and for the contract to schedule and, and the work and, and do everything that's needed to be done. Unfortunately, it's happened during construction, which takes away the leverage and it introduces a, a lot of things that need to be negotiated with the contract that raises the price up. But I guess the point that I'm trying to say is that the work needs to happen no matter what, whether we do it, we did it prior to construction or we do it during construction. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that some costs were to be expected to do this work. It's just that it's happening um, after the bid time. Uh, this is a, an overview of how the change orders are uh, distributed. You can see on the lower side, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, the unforeseen fuel condition takes the chunk of the work, but there is, a, or the uh, chunk of the contingency, but there's many other things that have uh, contributed to this cost going up. Going forward, commissioners, the Grayson Creek Bridge, this is a bridge and it's the only bridge in the project that needs to be replaced. And the reason is because it needs to be raised by about eight feet so that there is more resiliency for flooding. And right now uh, you can see some of the cranes on the old alignment, the old bridges, the contractor has already started putting some piles. So we need to take down that portion or those two bridges that are there. We need to build them up and connect them to the medium bridges so that we have the new bridges. So this is a work is critical. We have to get out of there before the season, uh, the environmental season again, which is between June 15 and October 15, uh, it's completed. And uh, over at Walnut Creek, this bridge does not need to be replaced. It just needs to be widened like the other ones. And this is another critical activity because again, we have to get out of the creek in the same time frame. So once those two bridges are built, we're gonna be able to pay between the bridges and we'll be able to connect to the existing express lane 
Uh, this four over here is past the 242 interchange. In fact, the three lanes just right are the traffic coming from 242 looking eastbound. And as you can see, we have done a lot of paving there. And as soon as, soon as we can, we're gonna be able to open up the express lane. So here is a, an overview of where we stand right now. Uh, the project is expected to be completed uh, in, at around this time next year, July 19th, 2021. We, schedule-wise, we are 52% completed. And uh, there is also a table there explaining where we are in relation to the budget. There is a concern because the contingency, which is the fourth row all the way on the right, shows a percent expanded of 84%, which is relatively high when you compare to the other items in the allotment, is particularly the bid items, which is the original scope that the contractor planned for, where they are 55%. Um, so with that, I am open to any questions. All right, questions from commissioners. Bob, yes, Bob Taylor, I'm waving. I Hi, Bob. See. I, I yeah, let me, uh, let me. I have to have Ivan take the screen down. Oh, okay. Ivan, yes. stop sharing. There we go. Now I can see people. Okay, Bob, you're up. Uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, question, Ivan, it's now past June 15th. You said uh, it had to be out of there by June 15th. Did I mistakenly hear that? Uh, no, Commissioner, I'm, 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 I might have misspoken. The window starts June 15th and goes through October 15th. So we're, uh, you we're there. You said we had to be out by June 15th, and I was going to tell you we're late. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I'm on a, I'm a, I'm a misspoken. I apologize. Okay. Okay, Newell. Uh, Ivan, thanks again. We always like hearing from you, uh, even when we don't hear the best news. Um, what I didn't hear you say is um, we're at 55% um, expenditure on completion um, with the main contract, 84% uh, contingency. What are you estimating? 12 months from now, where will we be? What will it look like? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the, really the hard question to answer. But uh, what, what I can tell you is that we have done most of the work that requires us to deal with the ground. The, a lot of the issues that we have encountered are related to different site conditions. Um, However, having said that, we, we recently had another issue come up that we might have to deal with. So it's, it's very hard for me to project that, Commissioner. What I can tell you is that you have given us a construction allotment. Uh, part of that is the contingency. So we think that there's within that allotment still uh, some room that we can maneuver with. Um, I, I would hate to portray to you that there, you know, I'm optimistic about how we're gonna finish here. I think that is, I cannot say with certainty right now. And the reason is because, I don't know if you remember the last time I gave you an update where there were numerous issues that had to do with the Federal uh, Aviation Administration because we were in their way. There were uh, pipelines that were underneath our footings and so on. So every turn that we make, it seems like we encounter new things that are not expected. And um, I can tell you that we have done, in spite of all the things that we have gone through, and including, by the way, you know, we had to shut down sometimes work because the Calico was closed because of the wildfires. Recently, we had to put into work because CHP was not available because they were tending to other issues. Some weather uh, issues, uh, we still managed to make that traffic switch which is, is, re, is, is the most critical thing that, that we do. So it's hard for me to give you an idea, but what, what I can tell you is the staff is focused on giving this project to the public in the time that we told them we were gonna give it to them. And we're doing everything that we can to work within the allotment that you have provided to us. Great, and what's your level of confidence uh, with, the con with the construction team that's uh, uh, running the project, are they at the highest level? Are you satisfied or are we having to help um, um, do extra time to coerce them into getting it done? Where, where are they at in that? 
So, so that's a very good question, Commissioner. We we uh, we had to do some some changes. The the original team was was a very good team. I feel uh, I know I have known Joe Reyes for almost twenty years. He and I worked together over at uh, at Caldecott. I mean, at Carquinez Bridge. So I have a great confidence in him. But there was some issues related to uh, personalities that I think might have been getting in the way. So we made the necessary uh, staff replacement and and. Uh, very recently, in fact, I got a call from the owner of the company, Russell Marin Wall, and he called me and gave me several compliments to the new staff member that's on in the project. Uh, her name is Joy Denning. So we're, we're very confident that the team is doing well. And we also have had conversations with them about how we're going to manage their budget because we don't want to go and bring additional money to that particular contract. So we're doing everything that we can. Uh, so to answer your question, I think we have confidence in the team. Great. Well, it sounds like we got confidence in you and you're, you're, you're on top of it. And that last question, I think, is important to uh, sort of foretell where we're going to end up a year from now. So thank you. Yes, hopefully all those things hidden underground have now been found and we won't have too many more unexpected things in the way. But... Um, we're not done yet, so <laughs> let's hope we don't find too much more. Okay, any other questions on this item? If not, we will go ahead and go to the action item associated with this, and that is item Wait, two. I'm waving my hand. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Bob. That's all right. Uh, I guess, Ivan, just to satisfy, you know, was discussed quite thoroughly at, at APC, and I'm I'm just worried about a an over an overrun on the contingency. I think I brought that up before, and I think Newell also cited with me on that. What happens if if something really does pop and you've insinuated something could? Um, uh, what are we going to do with this contingency? This is the closest since I've been there in a long time that we've come this close to this. Um, something of this nature. Yeah, so uh, like I was explaining earlier to uh, what is the fact that, you know, you, you have given staff a construction allotment and even though the contingency might be exceeded, there is still room within that construction allotment where we can maneuver some of the funds and and bring additional funds to the contingency without having to go to and increase in the construction alignment. So in other, in other words, we're gonna be doing some trade-offs. So you've already made up our mind that we are gonna do trade-offs, where I think at APC, that hadn't been totally uh, situated. So so we're gonna get through this, huh, Ivan? Yeah, so, so, so Commissioner, so let, let me, Take a step back a little bit. So I don't. I don't want to tell you. I don't feel right now necessarily that we're going to exceed the contingency. But what I do want to tell you is that if we did, which I, I cannot tell you right now, if you can, that there's there's some room there to be able to navigate the situation. And uh, my hope is, like you suggested, Commissioner, uh, once the construction season. I mean, not the construction season. The the restriction on the creeks are completed and we have made progress on the two bridges. I will be more than happy to come and give you a, an additional update, uh, maybe in the November uh, board meeting to give you another update where we are on the progress and the contingency and the overall construction alignment as well. Okay, Randy. Yeah, commissioners, hope for the best plan for the worst. And so we're always monitoring that budget so we can come to you before we break a budget and that's what Ivan and I learned as resident engineers don't go into the boss's office and have no, no options. And so we're looking at the whole allocation. The other key piece here is we're trying to learn from what happened on this project. And so Ivan touched on it very briefly, but what happens is if you did more coring in design, you would do less hitting of things that you didn't see in construction. So if you're trying to save money in design, it results in, many times big change orders in construction. So maybe spend a few thousand more dollars up front coring a couple more places and less in construction. So Tim is tasked with doing better, not better, 
uh, a more <laughs> thorough job of, of QC, QA, the design phase. And it, it makes Ivan's hair not graze as fast and it helps us manage the risk. And that, and at the end of the day, is what you've asked us to do by allowing us to take over the construction phase and not have Caltrans do it, is we try to manage that risk. And so we're trying to minimize that risk so that we have less of these updates where we're on the edge. Randy, let me ask you a question. I have seen uh, in the last week two different technical articles talking about x-ray under the surface, how you can see through the pavement to see what's down there in the way. Is that a realistic option for any of this yet? Is that cost prohibitive still? There are ground penetrating radar systems that can detect buried objects. And so the we didn't use that on this, but if you remember, you allowed me to continue my chairmanship on the, the strategic highway research program, renewal program that was authorized by Congress. So I led a team of researchers and practitioners and academicians that looked at various technologies that would help accelerate construction and GPR, ground penetrating radar is one of them. And so, yes, you can see below the surface on this case, we didn't use that, but in the future, we can, but we did use on this project is intelligent compaction. And so you measure where the roller goes. And Ivan did a great, a great video talking about that technology and how we were one of the first agencies to, to test that or to deploy that. So using technology, our inspectors can be inspecting a portion of the work in the south end or the, it'd be the west end of the project, but watch the compaction on the east end of the project because technology is watching the roller and checking the compaction for making sure that they're not overrolling the asphalt concrete ramps. So technology is helping us not only make sure that our pavements are longer lied because they're compacted properly, but also making our inspection more efficient so it saves us money so that Ivan has a bigger allotment in construction to work with so that in case if it goes over in the construction side, the support side can help support that. So how expensive is that ground penetrating radar? Is that prohibitively expensive still? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that they're using it more and more. Uh, we wouldn't buy that technology. As you know, we contract out 95% of our work. And so we would hire a consultant, ask them to do a better job of potholing and or instead of potholing, as you mentioned, uh, Ch Chair Pierce, use GPR to find where those pipes are because that's really what I am frustrated about is that it's every time they poked a hole in the ground to build a right in the middle of the bridge, there's there's a pipe and it all the plans showed it didn't have a 90 degree bend in the pipe, but for some reason at 90 degree bend right where he was driving, they were driving the pile to support the new bridge. I think every agency I've ever sat on that deals with construction has had those issues come up. So it seems like we ought to be making use of the technology available to whatever extent we can to predict this stuff ahead of time. Yes, and as, as we mentioned early on, as we started this construction program at CCTA, you can pay for it two ways. You can ask the contractor to assume the risk of unforeseen conditions, which you're gonna pay if you hit something or you don't, or if you'd miss them, then, then we don't have this problem. But if you hit things, that's what you have a contingency for. Yeah. And so then you pay. And so it's, it's probably cheaper in the long run to pay for it the way we do it than to pay for it at bid time. And you have risks that depending on what the situation is, you might pay and it never materializes and you have to pay for it anyway. All part of risk management. Yes. Okay. okay. Any other questions for staff on this information item? Okay, then we're gonna to go to the second part of this item and we're gonna talk about payments. So, Ivan. Thank, thank you again. Pay more money. Sure. Uh, like, uh, like I was explaining in my presentation that uh, there has been numerous challenges uh, in the project, but the contractor has maintained the schedule, which is always perhaps the most effective way to reduce costs is just keep the schedule going. And with that, they have requested uh, the authority to stop collecting a retention. The government code, public contract code, requires the authority to take a 5% retention of every payment that the contractor is paid. But at the 50% level, uh, where we are currently, uh, the authority can make a finding 
that the contractor has made significant progress in the field delivering the project and then suspend the collection of additional retention. So the way it works is that the current retention that has been held at the 5% level will stop being collected and theoretically towards the end of the project, that retention will decrease to about two and a half percent. So at the end of the project, we, the authority will still have two and a half million dollars of retention in, in the bank. And I think that provides enough incentive for the contractor to complete the work as fast as possible. So with that, staff recommends uh, adoption of resolution 2022P, which will find that the contractor has made good progress and will uh, allow staff to stop collecting retention. Second. Questions. Okay, I heard a second. I don't know where the first was. Move. Was there, I moved to. Okay. Arnrich moves, Hudson seconds. You just wanted to prove you were here, didn't you? Well, Ivan did such a good job of the motion, I was going to second it. <laughs> All right, very good. So we have a motion in a second. Is there any further discussion on this item? I don't see any hands waving. I don't see any hands raised. All right. So let's go to a vote on that. Terry Ann? Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Romick? Yes. Commissioner Taylor? Yes. Vice Chair Geringer? Yes. Chair Pierce? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. The next item is one that Terry Ann is going to present, seeking authorization to enter into an agreement with Beverage and Diamond to provide general legal counsel services to the authority. Terry Ann, take it away. Chair Pierce, I'm just gonna recuse myself from the item since we did propose. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mala. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. This is Terry Ann Grover, Director of Administrative Services, and I'm here this evening seeking authorization to execute an agreement with Beverage and Diamond to provide general counsel legal services to the authority for three years from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. We issued an RFP in March and we received five proposals. A review committee was formed consisting of Commissioner Arnrich, Randy, Brian, and myself. We ranked the proposals and invited four of the firms to interview, including our current firm, Best Best and Krieger. Interviews were conducted in May 2020. Uh, based on the proposals and interviews, Beverage and Diamond was ranked uh, number one after demonstrating a clear understanding of our objectives, vision, and goals. They are a local firm located in San Francisco, and they've worked with other transportation agencies, including Caltrans. Their fixed fee retainer pricing was competitive. Uh, the contract is for 282,000 for the three years of the contract. And that would be 7,500 per month for years one through two, 8,000 per month for year three, and then about approximately $2,000 per year for travel and administrative expenses. Uh, there will be an option for two one-year extensions on that contract. And average hours range from 20 to $30, 30 hours per month, but that can vary and includes all services except for specialized services such as litigation. Uh, they do charge those separately and they're to be pre-approved. They offer a blended rate of $395. Uh, we are working with Best Best and Krieger and Beverage and Diamond to ensure that there will be a smooth transition and that the projects, programs and work will be handed over without interruption. And, um, as Mala mentioned, she's on here, so we wanted to, uh, you know, thank her for her service and, and also let you know that David McRae with uh, Beverage and Diamond is also on the uh, Zoom meeting here. Um, so that concludes my presentation and I'll take any questions that you may have. Okay, any questions for Terri Ann? Dave. Yeah, Terri Ann, you said three years and two one-year extensions. Two one-year one year, two option for two one year extension. So we could okay. extend it for up to two years. I have like every piece of paper in the world except the staff report. When do you make the determination for the two one year? I mean, for this third, fourth year. Um, it would probably be toward the end of the third year. There is also a 30 day out clause on for either party. So, you know, if something wasn't going well on either side. We could also uh, do a 30 day out clause as well. Okay. I, I know somebody will answer. Is, is it one of those things that 
it's a February meeting or a March meeting that we have to make this decision. You know where I'm going with this thing. Is it, is it something that isn't going to be between new authority members or a, it's, it gives you plenty of time of the people that have been experiencing, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're working on a, a we on a transition plan now. And then at the end of the contract, we would, um, you know, either we would do what we're doing now, which is, would be an RFP or extend the contract. Okay. Where's Newell? Ask the question better than me. I mean, what, uh, what's the timeline on it? Dave, I'll answer. Right now? Oh, July 1st. Yeah. So it starts July 1st. If we were going to make a change, it would be in the budget time frame, which is right mid-year. So we wouldn't have any newbies on that didn't know what was going on. Yeah. So current, I saw, uh, pardon? Oh, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> I, I saw Karen, you raised your hand. Yeah, I somehow, I, there's no raised hand thing here. Um, and I know they're on the line um, and it's always good to go out to RFP, but was the decision solely a financial one? Um, has there been a concern about the services uh, provided? I mean, to switch, you know, th this is a major switch and I'd, I'd really like a little bit more background. Karen, I'll answer that one and not put staff on the spot. I will tell you that uh, some of us at admin had said, you know, just like our auditing teams, every once in a while, it's good to go out and look at the market for right. some of our contracts. And so we thought it was good to do an RFP and BBNK did submit, they were competitive and the interview team took a look at it and thought, you know, changing things up is probably not a bad idea. So that's the only reason is it's a good idea to change it up? Once in a while, yeah. Newell? Well, well I I, yeah, that. I, I, since I was on that, that team, I, I would uh, state it differently. Well, first of all, BB&K has done an outstanding job. They came in um, for the exact same reason that we're doing it now. We had had a, a long-term um, firm and we went out and um, BBK came along and they had um, a value proposition, not really so much financially. It was really the staff and everybody that was available. I have to tell you, this is a very unique opportunity. I would have never guessed um, had I not been able to sit there and do the interview. Um, the individual that's going to be assigned to this is a, um, an attorney that used to be with Caltrans, has worked with our staff, some of our former Caltrans staff has an outstanding reputation amongst transportation agencies from top to bottom and brings a level of knowledge that um, is so unique. Um, you know, we've had, um, as Maul and them, um, great attorneys. Um, this particular attorney that's assigned to us um, is, is the deepest dive I think any of us have ever seen. And I, I was on this authority with both of our previous councils, and I think those are the only two we've had in its history, maybe a third one. Um, it's just a unique opportunity, and the numbers and, and those things are, are pretty much equal. And by the way, BBK was, was um, uh, they were second, and this other firm was first. Um, the two best firms are, are the ones that came out, in my opinion, were rated number one and two. Um, but this really is a unique opportunity. Somebody who has more knowledge specifically about transportation contracting, both federal, state, levels in such a depth that we've never seen that. And I think that's just a little different than where we are, um, have been in the past for what I think our needs are. Um, we're gonna be out there competing much more deeply um, for federal funds as it looks like they're starting to come um, and getting the right um, counsel and how to approach those, I think is something, it's just another asset um, that I think we should take advantage of. Okay, any other questions? Okay, are, were there any um, comments by the public, Terri Ann? No, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. So if there's no other, I don't see any waving hands in front of me. So if there are no other comments, do I have a motion? Move approval, Romick. Second. Romic first and Arnrich second. All right, Terry Ann, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. 
Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Romick? Yes. Commissioner Taylor? Yes. Vice Chair Geringer? Yes. Chair Pierce? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All righty. And the next item is a presentation by Tim Hale to discuss the framework and principles for the development of a draft allocation plan. This is what Randy was referencing earlier in uh, relationship with the budget and our decrease in funds. Tim, take it away. Good evening, uh, com uh, Commissioner Pierce, Chair per Pierce, and uh, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present. My name is Tim Hale, the Deputy Executive Director of Projects, and I'll be talking today about the frameworks and principles of allocation for the draft allocation plan. And I just want to share my screen here. Everyone can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay. So the authority approved resolution 20-9-P in May 2020 and 20 last at the last authority board meeting with a number of actions to reduce the impacts from COVID-19 and the authority board also authorized staff to develop an allocation plan and fund exchange program. The allocation plan will need funding principles to guide its development. Primarily, the principles will follow four major objectives, timely use of funds, leveraging, deliverability, and readiness. We don't wanna lose any funds and give them to other agencies outside of our county. We wanna make sure that we keep all the funds here in our county and make sure that we're out, uh, allocating to projects so that federal and state funds are not jeopardized. We also wanna reward projects that have been leveraging Measure J funding on projects such as other grants as ATP grants, OBAG funding, et cetera. And when we also wanna continue funding projects with match requirements like the ADS and ATC and TD grant, and we will also focus on projects that are shovel ready by July of 2021. Communication is key, and we have shared these principles with the uh, Technical Coordinating Committee, and Hisham has started to present to the RTPCs about the impacts due to COVID-19. Staff has completed an initial screening of the authority projects, which will be discussed later in the presentation. And communication is important, and we are, and we are coordinating with the local sponsors on where the projects are, the fund types, where, when, when are we going to deliver these projects, understanding which projects could be, be potentially federalized for potential uh, stimulus funding packages. And likewise, we want to make sure that everyone understands some of the limitations and challenges relative to the funding, so that way, if a project doesn't get funded, there's really no surprises. Um, spending, we've been spending a lot of time with the local partners. We just sent out the request this week for information on every single one of these projects. And we also need to develop a long range revenue forecast to determine really the total impact of the Measure J revenues out until 2034. Due to the limited availability of Measure J funding, the authority will primarily rely on other revenues from federal, state, and regional fund sources to advance our projects in the future. Priority will be given to those projects that are expected to compete well for grant opportunities and can meet match requirements. We will also prioritize projects based on the principles and future grant opportunities to continue to leverage and replace Measure J funding. And once these projects are identified, we will develop a fund exchange program. So the fund exchange plan will really focus on opportunities within our current projects and programs to really better utilize our limited Measure J funding. We also look at uh, current allocations and future allocations of STIP funds to help offset Measure J projects to get them shovel ready. We'll also look at opportunities to exchange STIP fundings and other funds that are more flexible with local funds when it makes sense from a, from a, from a schedule standpoint. So for example, on the State Route 4 Operational Improvement Project, the STIP funds there, they're seven and a half million dollars available in the 2021 cycle. We might consider actually re reprogramming those funds similar in the same corridor to the 684 interchange for future phases because the Serial 4 operational improvement project has, an, a, has a, a major funding shortfall for construction and rather the 684 interchange has a, a $210 million allocation from regional measure three, 
which will help us to compete better for grant funding and match funding for, for grant opportunities. We also wanna look at the projects and make sure we build and identify projects that would be shovel ready and would be qualified for potential stimulus funds. We may not know what the stimulus package may look like, but it's probably going to look like a lot like the old ARA package where you would need match, match funding and be on a certain, deliver it within a certain time frame. We also wanna make sure we're looking for opportunities to uh, innovative type grants, FTA grants, FHWA grants, to really replace any Measure J funds we possibly can, not just with projects, but also with programs to really help with our limited Measure J um, resources. As Randy's always talking about and the team's talking about, we always need to make sure that our expenditures do not exceed our revenues. We need to better understand of the understanding of the long range revenue forecast for the allocation plan. So staff and in, in, in coordinating with Brian and our consultants, we're trying to determine really the best time to develop a forecast due to the uncertainty in the economy. Staff is constantly monitoring sales tax revenue and as Brian's just reported today, sales tax is starting to increase. So we will continue to coordinate with HDL and monitor when would be the best time to do a long range revenue forecast. However, it, is, it could be expected that revenues could be reduced by another two to $300 million, but we are hoping the economy recovers in a V or W as shown in the, in the, in the graph here, where in the green. So that way it would hopefully minimize the impact to our overall revenues. Once the revenue forecast is completed, we will be able to determine which projects will be impacted based on the allocation plan. So, for project expenditures, the yellow line is the total sales tax revenue that we've been that we are we have, have received in actuals and will receive projected. And capital projects receives 42 and a half percent of those revenue as shown in the orange line. Debt services shown in red, and you can see the spikes in red as we as we went out and, and um, um, purchased more bonds on our future sales tax revenue. Cap so cap. The payment of debt service comes off the top of the sales tax revenue and is, it is expected to be paid with the 42.5% allocated to the capital projects. Capital projects has been accumulating cash reserves based on the revenues exceeding debt, debt service in the early years. And we are now entering into the pinch point in the measure as Hisham and Randy and others have been talking about through the update of the 2019 strategic plan, as well as the presentation you heard last month. As we continue to deliver our projects, we are spending those cash reserves, we are spending the bond proceeds. And so before the pandemic, the 42.5% was, was able to cover the debt service. But based on the declining revenue projections, debt service is expected to exceed the 42.5%. And that is why we need to slow allocations, reduce expenditures until we better understand the impact to, ins to ensure that expenditures meet revenues for the capital projects. Some options that staff is considering is to phase projects, delay projects, look at refinancing the bonds, as well as any internal loans possibly to borrow from future revenues. Under the scenario of the internal loan, we could use excess revenues above the debt service in the outer years as shown in the graph, starting in year 2020, 2029, 2030, to be able to pay back any internal loans, but it would potentially limit the authority's ability to bond future revenue. So staff is evaluating all of this as part of the allocation plan and is planning on coming back to the board with any new policies. And I know all of your projects are really important to you from the locally sponsored projects and staff has been reviewing the locally sponsored projects included in the 2019 Measure J strategic plan and the TLC PBTF programming documents that are expected to seek Measure J appropriations and that is attached in your staff report as attachment B. And also I have several slides here with the same projects. These projects will be subject to the allocation plan and would be prioritized based on the principles. So we have been, pro we've been in the process of contacting local jurisdictions, gathering information, determining how each project meets the principles. And although exceptions can be made on a case by case basis to prevent loss of other fund sources, the authority will not make any new Measure J appropriations until the alloc allocation plan is developed and the long term uh, revenue forecast is approved. Projects that can be federalized are good candidates the, for potential future stimulus and will be identified in the process to determine if Measure J funds can be replaced by the other future funds programmed by the authority and authority staff will coordinate and identify opportunities where we can support the delivery of future capital projects to potentially reduce costs such as projects like the Iron Horse Trail pedestrian overcrossing that the, the authority is supporting the city of San Ramon with. 
Consistent with policy 15 in the 2019 strategic plan, project sponsors have the option to advance their projects at your own risk and sponsors would have to request authority board approval prior to proceeding. If approved, the authority would commit by resolution to reimburse the local jurisdiction at a future date consistent with the project programming and future strategic plans and other applicable policies. However, if the long-term revenue forecast does not support the appropriations, the project sponsor will be at risk and will not be reimbursed for their costs. So on this slide, we're showing projects within our BART program, Contra Costa County, Clayton, and Concord. And on the next slide, we show projects from Danville, El Cerrito, Hercules, Moraga, and Orinda. And we're here, we're showing the unappropriated balances as well as um, unallocated program state and federal funds. And, and per, the, per the principles in the allocation plan, we're, we're basically saying that projects with state and federal funds would be prioritized over other projects depending on, depending on the, the amount of measure day resources in the allocation plan and the long range revenue, revenue forecast. This, this page shows Pinole, Pittsburgh, Pleasant Hill, Richmond, San Pablo, Walnut Creek, as well as the Walnut Creek bus stop access safety improvements. All of these projects will be subject to the allocation plan. The following are contracts that are actively and ongoing that are being managed by the authority. Staff is recommending to either reduce or suspend certain contracts under, until the long re revenue forecast and allocation plan is approved by the board. The list was developed based on an evaluation of our contract status, fund source, and ability to compete for other fund sources such as Senate Bill 1. Higher priority was placed on projects and contracts that leverage other fund sources such as federal state and funding, state funding and, re and require measure J to match funding requirements such as the, the I-680 Northbound Express Lanes project. Um, HDR is working on that project. It's fully funded by STP funds and federalized. Also the State Route 239 project that project is also fully funded by federal, by federal funding. In addition, deadlines to use any secure funds were, con were considered in the development of the recommendations and staff is seeking approval to temporarily reduce and or suspend these contracts managed by the authority that in attachment A of the staff report and shown here. Staff is anticipating a savings of about five and a half, six million dollars by slowing these contracts down until we have a better understanding of our long-term revenue forecasts and impacts from the pandemic. As part of the development of the allocation plan, staff will continue to look for other contracts and projects to reduce or suspend based on the long range revenue forecast. Communication is paramount in this entire process and we are holding, we are making sure we're consulting with our local sponsors this entire process. As I said, we're sending out uh, forms and information to gather data about each of these projects and work closely with our sponsors to understand and, and prioritize these projects. We also will continue to look for ways to temporarily suspend and reduce contracts, and we plan on bringing additional information to upcoming authority board meetings, including the prioritization framework, the long range revenue forecast, the allocation plan, and the funding in the fund exchange opportunities, and also develop the 2020 strategic plan. I don't necessarily have dates of when we bring these items back at this point, because as I noted, the allocation plan is really dependent upon the long range revenue forecast. And we are court and Brian and their, our consultants are really trying to understand when the best time to be do to, to do that. Until then, until the allocation plan and, and is, is approved and long range revenue forecast is approved, we plan on suspending and reducing contracts and no longer and temporarily um, um, suspending allocations to new to new phases or new projects. So with that, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions um, on my staff report. Okay, any questions? Uh, Tim, can you, thank you. Any questions for Tim? I'm looking, Newell? Um, I, I guess a question, comment. Um, you know, first of all, I think this is fair. We have a pretty serious event horizon, which is 14 years from now when this measure ends. Um, and I think this is really the first time um, the agencies really said, that's coming up, we have to recognize that. So it has to be balanced between now and then. And I think that's the point of Tim's presentation. Uh, the one thing we have to kind of keep in mind though, is while we want to prioritize prizes, take advantage of things, we still, on, on, you know, from a city perspective, we've got to make sure we're equitable. You know, just because a project got some matching funds, the measure J allocation portion of it, um, 
if we all of a sudden find that half the cities all have a bunch of matching, they get money and they use all the money that we have left, we can't end up in that position. That's not how, it won't bode well when we go to um, reauthorize this measure um, here in a few years. Um, so there's the short term, the long term and the equity that just needs to be balanced. And, and I hear that, but I just want to say it out loud. Cities all need to make sure equity over this time, well, maybe you have to delay it, but ultimately we have to keep in place that the allocations that we committed to each city, while they might be less, we have to make sure that everybody gets their equitable share. That makes sense. Randy? I'm here. Right. Commissioner Arnett, you bring up a great point. So this is where we're going to need your help. So STIP allocations, OBAG allocations, we're going to have to think about where we place those dollars in the future to maximize the fairness, the equity, and the usage, the most pri highest priority usage of Measure J. That's what Tim was trying to say, as well as it's very, very difficult to get a federal grant anyway. But if you do, those are like one off. They're almost lucky you get one. And so we're focused in mostly on the STIP allocations, OBAG allocations, and we'll work with the board to make sure that we have a well thought out plan to provide equity to deal with exactly what you're talking about. Right, Chris. Yeah, I just want to second what Newell says. I think it's important that, you know, all of the cities, you know, get their fair share. And my hope is that if, the sales tax money does come back and we can look again at this allocation plan that perhaps we could bring back some of these projects. Um, Cause I know a lot of cities are really kind of counting on them. Um, so I just want to make that point. I think we have a lot of cities that have projects that they'd like to do that they've been planning on. Some of them aren't quite ready to go. Um, Concord and Clayton are partnering on a grant uh, application. We think we've got a good shot at getting that to do all of Pine Hollow Road from one end to the other. And um, we're really hopeful. So that 400000 that you saw on there for Clayton, that was a piece of savings from another grant that uh, might have been used there. But um, hopefully we'll all get the grant and that 400000 won't have to come back. It'll be okay. So yeah, we got to work on that. And any grants you see out there, go for them. Uh, so we can spend other people's monies instead of our own. That would be great. Who else has comments, questions? I'd move the item. Okay. Terry Ann, did we have any uh, public comment on this? I didn't see anybody. I don't no, see second. anyone either. Okay. I have a motion by Arnrich. Second. Second by Second by Hudson. Okay, and Terry Ann, please call the roll. Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Romit? Yes. Commissioner Taylor? Commuted, yes. Bob. Yes. Vice Chair Geringer. Yes. Chair Pierce. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you, Tim and Brian and Ivan and everybody. Uh, we really appreciate the diligence here in trying to figure out how we make our dollars go as far as they possibly can. Um, we have no planning committee regular agenda items on this um, on the uh, agenda this evening, but we do have correspondence letters in the packet. Are there any questions or comments on the letters that were included in the packet? I don't see anybody coming forward. Okay, we'll go to correspondence and communications. There is a letter from Caltrans to uh, address some of the concerns we expressed about working under COVID. There's the letters from our regional committees. Um, I have no uh, chair comments. Any commissioner comments? Yes, I have one. Oh, I oh, have one. Okay, Taylor and then Butt. Okay. Just, just for the record, uh, I think uh, if you haven't heard, the mayor of Brentwood is not going.
going to run for re-election this fall. So there, there it is, folks. Thanks. Well, I don't know how we're going to operate without him, but we'll we'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I wanted good, I wanted to announce that uh, the Richmond Ferry um, began service again on Monday, and I was there at six thirty riding the first boat, along with eleven other brave individuals. Um, we hope that uh, the word will get out and that the ridership will increase. They can only do 25% of, uh, of capacity right now because of social distancing, but um, they do have room for more than 25. So if any of you would like a nice ferry ride, this wonderful weather, come on over. Very good. All right. You got a thumbs up from Chris on that one. Any other comments from commissioners? Nobody else is waving at me. All right. Then um, any of our ex officio representatives want to make comments? Amy? Sure. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have a brief update from MTC. Um, uh, uh, we are still, we're, you know, the Blue Ribbon Task Force met last week and we are working with our operators to develop a region wide set of safety protocols for workers and uh, passengers. We feel that is central to getting our public back on our wonderful transit um, uh, properties of the, you know, the wide variety, smaller operators, larger operators. We anticipate that at, by the end of uh, our last meeting by July, the, we will be making a recommendation to the commission for the adoption of the remaining 39% of the CARES Act funding. Um, you know, we continue to work with ABAG on Plan Bay Area, um, and, you know, that includes many projects that are near and dear to our, our county, including, you know, a variety of, variety of projects that the authority has, has submitted to be included in that, in that regional plan. Uh, so, you know, again, it, we continue, same thing with the, you know, with the funding challenges, um, and, uh, We'll be keeping you all abreast as these uh, protocols come forward. You know, it's been a, it's the, I must say the transit operators have been phenomenal. Working together to come up with the first tranche of distribution uh, decisions and now the second one, and also on the safety, safety um, uh, efforts. They've really done a phenomenal job working with uh, their stakeholders and, and uh, workers and, and passengers. So uh, I think I think we'll we'll be doing everything we can in the Bay Area to um, make this the better. One of the one of the challenges that is as schools open, uh, whether it's the yellow school buses or the county uh, public transit agencies that provides home to school transportation. This continues to be a challenge, and a lot of it is frankly up in the air because we're not sure what the what the schools are going to be doing in terms of their scheduling uh, their their protocols but the good thing is they are mindful of the transportation element of the work that they are doing with their students so um, I know that many of you serve on transit boards or you're well aware of this so that's I think one of the challenges in, in Contra Costa County that we will be you know grappling with in the next month or so as these these school programs start to solidify. And I know all the local transit agencies are working with their local school districts to keep that communication open so that we can do the best we can to try to provide that uh, service. So that was one of the issues that has come up on the Blue Ribbon Task Force too, that to consider how important school transportation is in the work that uh, our regional you know, public transit agencies are providing. Okay, thanks. Thank Amy. Maureen, did you want to make any comments? No, nothing more to add. Thank you. Okay, Deborah, any reports? Unmute. Spacebar. I think we can unmute her. Hold on, let's see if I can unmute her. Yeah, okay. You just remuted her. There you go. I've got a new device. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, so um, BART is uh, one meeting away, two weeks, less than two weeks away from uh, passing our fiscal year 21 budget. 
was a, a long bumpy road. Um, this budget um, takes the fiscal year 20 budget and increases it by 6%. Um, that's uh, not something I necessarily agree with, but that is uh, the will of the board. Um, projected revenues will be approximately at 35% of ridership of, of our normally expected ridership. So um, we'll be reassessing that every quarter. Um, we'll hopefully, uh, we're all hoping and praying for a, a speedy recovery to this economy and, and a return to transit by everyone. Uh, that will certainly help things along. Um, just wanted to touch a little bit on the, um, the cleaning uh, protocols. BART has instituted some um, pretty substantial additional cleaning protocols. There's approximately uh, uh, $30 million additional in the fiscal year 21 budget for cleaning. And um, we have uh, acquired the backpack uh, sanitizing mist uh, technology, which is uh, really exciting because we can now, we now have the equipment uh, and the protocols in place to now mist every single train car once a day. Um, and that is actually a huge improvement. In addition to that, the train cars are wiped down at the end of each line. Uh, the surface points are, are wiped down. So um, I think we're, we're ready for people to come back and we're just waiting for that to happen. At last count, we were at 9% of our expected ridership. That's my report. Ouch. Okay. Um, you know, if there are no other uh, commissioner or um, ex officio reports, I want to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to Mala and to BBNK for what's it been 11 years, I think, of, of terrific service. And um, we're sad to see you go, but we know you'll be back probably in the next round. So we, we're glad to keep you in, in Clayton and I think Lafayette and other places. So uh, you won't be gone out from, uh, from seeing us, but uh, thank you. Thank you for all you've done as we've gone through all these very difficult years. Um, there've been lots of things to keep you busy and we appreciate having your beautiful face there at all of our meetings. So thank you so much. And we will go to Randy. Commissioners, I too want to add uh, thank you to Mala Charity and Kevin. There, as you know, we contract out 95% of our work, and our our consultants are really an extension of staff. That's how we we survive with so little public employees, and so we really lean heavily on our our consultants. So thank you for for that for that time. I wanted to talk a little bit very briefly, and maybe Commissioner Worth can help me on this. I attended a, a back to meeting, my third in a row. The, it's the last Friday of the month, so I've been three in a row, and and I actually went to uh, was invited to speak at a Express Lane Network Steering Committee for it was an executive level steering committee. And one of the issues on the docket is is equity, and there's a lot of studies about what equity means and how we're going to implement equity. And in our in our case, they, they they're looking at two Express Lane corridors that are BAFA, under BAFA and they're ready to go. And that's 880 and 680. And there was a lot of discussion about what equity means and all those kinds of things. But really what, what uh, Executive Director McMillan, Teresa McMillan is looking for is a, a fair redu a reduction for people under a certain wage limit. And, and I'm, I apologize, I know I haven't, we haven't brought this to the board. I, I, I made an assumption that that would be something that you all would be interested in and so I, you know, they wanted to study and a lot of times the best studies occur when you deploy something and then you study the results and make adjustments there. And I think that Interstate 680 is a good example because we're trying to accelerate or a good test bed because we're trying to accelerate the construction by a year. We're gonna have to open that lane uh, as an express lane hopefully so we don't have to grind off any striping and repave the whole freeway again for Caltrans. So open it up as an express lane. We have to get all the word out. You have to have a transponder. It's going to be HOV only all day long. All those kinds of things has to be articulated to the public. And I know Lindsay Willis is going to do a fantastic job working with MTC Caltrans to get the word out. But I, I, I thought that we would be amenable or at least 
approachable to that equity. So give a discount in fare uh, for the toll because I think it's going to be fifteen dollars to go from the bridge all the way south to the county line. And so um, that was a proposal. And, and as I said before, a lot of stu good studies sometimes come in the form of deployment and making adjustments on the fly versus studying something for a year and a half and then somebody telling you through an, um, a law or, or legislation or policy that you have to do it. So anyway, I just, I just wanted to brief you on that. Okay. Any questions of Randy on that, Amy? Yeah, did he oh, just throw Lindsay under the bus? No. No, Amy first and then Dave. Let, let me just add to that. I'm glad Randy. Uh, I'm glad Randy brought it up because we've been discussing express lanes a lot at MTC and at and at and at and at BATA. And I ch actually chair the BATA Oversight Committee, so these express lanes are near and dear to my heart. And we, as Contra Costa, we were part of the you know original MTC BAFA um, ex express lane network. And it's really the 680 corridor and then 580 coming east. And now we're going to pick up 880. Um, and the, the, the issue of equity um, it is, is really a challenging one. And it's one we want to address. And I, I really agree with Randy that getting it working, I think it's the kind of thing where we would use the, 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 the um, fast track and we are putting this in place through our, you know, program with Clipper, our transit um, uh, program. So I think we'll be able to use a lot of that experience we have with the, you know, the fare, um, uh, the the pilot program for reduced fares that we're working on right now. So um, the other equity piece about express lanes is the is the goal is to be able to have these lanes be available for express buses that in today's world uh, the cost of extending rail is so great the 680 corridor is, and when you look at 680 when you look at four coming in 680 coming down all the way from Solano to Santa Clara this is this is a workhorse corridor it's vital and and in order to get transit in that corridor express buses are are real real hope so um, that's where also we, uh, down the road, once we finish these capital investments and especially things like, as I say, untying the Walnut Creek knot, getting that 680 quarter working, um, I think from, a, from an equity standpoint, we'll be able to incorporate a, a number of elements too. So look forward to having Randy's expertise in that, in that process. And I agree, do it and then talk, talk, do and talk rather than study and then maybe do. So, and, and there's a lot of eagerness regionally to, to support the express lane uh, completion. Okay, Randy, did you have anything else on your executive staff report? No, no ma'am. Okie dokie, Dave, did you have anything or were you just being smart? Okay, got it. All right, calendars are in your packet for your perusal for your schedule of meetings for the next three, four months. Um, and the next item on the agenda is a public employee performance evaluation and conference with labor negotiators, which will be discussed in closed session. We will go into closed session per public employee performance evaluation pursuant to government code 54957 for the executive director. This is a conference with labor negotiators pursuant to that uh, same code with section six. And the agency designated representative is me as chair and the unrepresented employee is the executive director, uh, Randy Iwasaki. So we are currently um, going into closed session. Terry Ann, tell us what we do. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording on the videos and then put you into a breakout room. Okay, you're going to put us where we need to go. We don't have yeah. to do anything, right? Correct. All yeah. right, we are going into closed session. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Deborah. Yeah, we're just coming back. Undo. Okay. We are coming back. We um, just completed 
a closed session. We have no reportable action. And unless anybody has any other comments, we are adjourned. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Julie. Thanks, Robin. Yeah. While you're still there. Yeah. I think I'm going to write some kind of policy on the on the term. I'll be brief. <laughs>